Hello and welcome back to season two of the Science and Belief in Society podcast. I'm James Riley. We've got a jam-packed season ahead with amazing guests discussing science, technology and its relation to belief, religion and spirituality. Today, as I speak, Halloween celebrations are raging, flickering pumpkins illuminate the windows of my neighbours and the cold autumn breeze screams at my door. Well, it's not quite that bad, but there is a certain spookiness in the air. So quite appropriately, we're going to be discussing things that go bump in the night. But how do we know things go bump in the night? How do we know whether, in a seance, that the emotive experiences are genuine communications with the dead or some sort of trickery? Well, occultists, spiritualists and sceptics alike have used a range of technologies like cameras, radios and telegraphs to evidence or to debunk attempts to peek beyond the veil. In this episode, we're joined by Christine Ferguson, Ephraim Sarah Schreier and Emma Merkley, all researchers on the Media of Mediumship project. They investigate and tell the stories of the occultic and spiritualist paths of objects found in the Science Museum Group and Senate House Library collections. These stories highlight the complex relationship between science, technology, occultism and spiritualism from the mid-19th century on. So over to the conversation, where my co-host Will Mason Wilkes is amusing himself with ideas for appropriate names for a Halloween-themed podcast. other Halloween specials, none better loved uh, than The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror. And I'd like to think of this episode, if not as quite a treehouse of horror, then at least a conservatory of unease, um, or perhaps uh, an outhouse of mild panic, maybe even a shed of fear. Uh, But that's enough, quite enough of this. (laughs) Indeed, we don't want to lose listeners before we start. Um, But today we are joined by Christine, Ephraim and Emma. So everyone, how are you doing? Let's go with you first, Christine. Oh, hello. I'm very well. Thanks. Good to be here on um, what we're going to call it, maybe the toilet of doom. I think there's there's more where we, we can run with that title there. Um, yeah. I am coming to you from uh, sunny Glasgow and uh, where I, I work at the University of Stirling in English literature. Perfect. Thanks, Christine. And Ephraim, how are you doing today? I am also doing well, and I think that The Twilight of Doom is a good title for the general atmosphere of the world right now, so I like (laughs) it quite a lot. Yes. Uh, And Emma? Hi. Yeah, I'm doing good, thanks. I'm here in London, which is probably about as gloomy as Scotland. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. So we're here to talk about your project, which is the Media of Mediumship. Um, I just wondered if each of you could just give us a tiny bit, a little bit of um, a flavour of your backgrounds, where you're coming from as researchers. Sure, I'll start. Um, I am a specialist in English literature, but for the past ooh, quite a while now, um, I, let's just say, uh, my research is really focused on the interactions between literature and science in the 19th century. And really literature and what we might think of as alternative forms of science, um, particularly um, occult um, and spiritualist movements. So um, I come to this project, um, which is really taking me away from reading textual accounts of the occult and the uh, super, supernatural psychic investigation in the 19th century to thinking about um, the uh, material objects. Um, scientific technologies that were used to actually explore these phenomena in real life. Um, and I'm leading this project along with um, Emma and Ephraim. That's fascinating. Thanks, Christine. Um, what about yourself, Ephraim? Could you just tell us a little bit more about uh, yeah, your background and how you've kind of got came, come to this project? No, no problem at all. So I'm a, a historian of science and belief, and I also am an anthropologist, a historical anthropologist. And I came to this project uh, via my most recent book that's coming out in June 2022 with the University of Pittsburgh Press, which is called Psychic Investigators. And uh, that book explores the relationship between the emergence of anthropology of religion in the 19th century and its engagement with the modern spiritualist movement, which is a rise around the same time in the sort of second half of the 19th century. And uh, I'm also a senior researcher at the Science Museum which of course is where uh, most of the uh, objects that we're using for the project are stored. So that is where all of these things come together. Thanks Ephraim. And, and yourself, Emma? I'm, a, I'm an art historian at the Cotold Institute of Art 
uh, where I've been teaching 19th century art for the past couple months. Um, and my, my PhD focused on a Victorian artist, a late Victorian artist who was also a spiritualist. And I looked at how her art was sort of engaging or mobilizing imagery from science and alternative science from sort of the same period, 1880s to 1910. Um, so physics, mathematics, psychical research. And yeah, I guess um, since my PhD, I've been increasingly looking at that intersection, sort of those crossovers between visual culture, history of science and history of the occult. Uh, thanks, everyone. So uh, your project is called The Media of Mediumship, Encountering the Material Culture of Modern Occultism in Britain's Science, Technology and Magic Collections. So firstly, uh, let's start with some definitions. So could I ask, what is occultism and uh, what is material culture? And also, why is it important to study the media of mediumship? That's great. Thanks very much, James. Um, I will uh, start off with this first term, occultism, which, of course, is quite a, a contentious one now. But really, it, it has, it's one that's got quite a long history. Um, occultism as, as a thing, as a body of knowledge, obviously draws upon the word occult. That word's been around with us for a long time, from the Latin occultatus. And originally that just refers to things that were hidden or unknown. So until probably around the 16th or 17th century, the term occult doesn't really have anything to do with the magic, magical or supernatural. It really could refer to say qualities of, of a plant or a natural phenomena that we don't yet understand. We don't know how it works. And it could be then used in scientific context because the scientific experiments, what's going to reveal that which was formerly occult. But what we see during the Enlightenment is the increasing association of this term uh, of things that are occult with the kinds of beliefs or practices or doctrines that are being rejected by science, um, that are labelled as superstitious or magical and some such. Um, the term occultism um, really becomes popular in the 19th century um, through its usage by particular really high profile magical practitioners. So I'm talking about Eliphas Le Levy, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, in France, um, H.P. Blavatsky, um, who is a, 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 a Russian theosophist um, who is moving around America and the US in this time. Um, and what does it mean? Well, really, Occultism is, is a broad church, it's an umbrella term that can bring together, um, as I said, all kinds of beliefs and practices that are being seen as um, sort of anti-scientific, superstitious, magical, so it could include astrology, Kabbalah, crystal gazing, um, mesmerism, divination, but also of course communication with the dead. Um, and I should say something about that. Another movement or perhaps the most important movement in the 19th century that's interested in, in techniques of communicating with the dead is modern spiritualism. And modern spiritualism is a new religious movement that takes off at the mid, uh, mid 19th century after um, uh, sort of being founded in, uh, in America by the Fox sisters. Um, but I, I, I should probably point out there is some tension and rivalry um, between spiritualists and occultists um, who maybe wouldn't like to be known under the same label. Um, nowadays, often people who are practicing spiritualism would reject the term occultism because for them it would have connotations of um, maybe de dark magic, devil worship and so forth. Um, uh, but in the time that we're looking at, there is some crossover in these terms. So there's not hard and fast distinctions between them. And then a final thing I want to say about occultism in this period, the way that term is being used, is that while we might think of occultism as referring to like sort of ancient or, you know, eclipsed beliefs, people who embrace this term in the 19th century really see what they are doing as a form of science, right? So occultism is occult science. Um, it um, maybe is compatible or an improvement upon existing forms of scientific naturalism, or maybe what they do, um, their practices actually um, relate to um, 
scientific principles and laws that are not yet known or not yet understood, but in time can be. So maybe there is, for example, a physics of communicating the dead with the dead that we know about. So that broadly is um, what we are talking about when we refer to occultism and its and its products in this period. And sort of to to just add to what Christine was saying, I mean, I always find that in the 19th century, it's helpful context to remember that the physics of things like energy are just being formulated for the first time. And it made sort of eminent sense to a lot of scientists that other energies that were somehow beyond visibility or beyond tangibility, you know, other forces might exist that had likewise not yet been explored by science and someday might yet reveal themselves. Um, I might tackle the material culture part of the question as sort of the resident art historian. I guess material culture refers to the objects people use and sort of the sets of um, practices and contexts that surround them, you know, how the objects are used, uh, made, or otherwise engaged with in specific environments. And of course, in our case, the material culture that we're interested in is that surrounding the uh, technological artifacts and products of our focus in the specific context of occultism in the 19th and 20th centuries, which has sort of meant a lot of dredging the various archives and finding objects that were used in occult contexts, um, sort of how did occultists and also debunkers use, understand, sort of discuss, uh, adapt objects like cameras, x-rays, radios, and so on for their differing purposes, what about them suited specific needs or ends that sort of all falls under the material culture umbrella. Oh, that's, that's so so fascinating. And, and as you said, that idea the the um that at this period in history, these the the kind of clear boundaries that might have been established between between this this practice and scientific practice is still kind of up for debate. And I know we're going to kind of come on to talking uh, talking in that area as we as we kind of progress the conversation. So it's fascinating. Um, I mean, there was uh, a third aspect to that question, which I suppose I, I'm, I'm jumping in on the the person who's interested in media, I suppose. Um, but um, I mean, yeah, what, what 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 how is media implicated in the in in the project as a whole? So I think one of the things if we just think specifically about spiritualism for a moment. There is a natural relationship between media technology, which is often about communication and spiritualism, in that spiritualists, one of the core activities that they participate in is communicating with entities beyond the veil. And so as these new types of media technology start to be developed at the end of the 19th century, at the turn of the 20th century, spiritualists are often early adopters of this new technology because they want to see how these new types of communicative tools can be used within the seance setting. So everything from new radio technology to typewriters to telephones, you name it, is by some spiritualist practitioner going to be tried out within the confines of a seance. And to a certain degree, you also have different kinds of occultists adopting that as well. But I'll let Christine talk more to the occultists. Mostly what you've described, the spiritualist use would overlap with the occultist one. So it's difficult for me to think of an occultist use out with deliberate attempts to communicate with the dead. So unless you had something else in mind. No, I think it's quite similar. It's the same with the theosophists as well. I mean, when you think about Blavatsky's use of the typewriter, it's not yeah, yeah. so dissimilar yeah, yeah. to how the spiritualists are using it. Yeah, yeah. And, and is a, a sort of is this visual media? Is also this kind of radio is one of the things. I mean, are, are visual media being visual yeah. media being engaged and used in these ways as well? In these things, is just a kind of a, any technology that kind of can yeah, be yeah. used yeah, and absolutely. developed. Absolutely. So the obvious with. visual technology is photography. Mm -hmm. And in fact, photography is one of the first kinds of technology that's, you know, adopted by the spiritualist movement for seance work. But it's not just things like uh, that are high tech because things like, you know, paintbrushes are used by mediums as well. For instance, there's a whole area of artwork that emerges from the movement. So it can be everything from the most cutting edge photographic technology to, you know, using a piece of chalk as well. It, there's a whole diverse range there. And in terms of the, the media that our project covers, it's photography, cameras, sort of those visual media, radiographs also, so sort of medical media and medical technologies. And then as Ephra mentioned, sort of communications technologies are a big part of it. 
spiritual telephones, telegraphs, radios. Um, I think Richard Noakes, uh, Professor Richard Noakes at Exeter has written a bit about this, but the spiritual telegraph is a metaphor that's really commonly used in the 19th century by spiritualists to refer to how, what the mechanism is whereby spirits sort of, you know, um, of the dead might be communicating with the living, sort of that idea of a relay battery connecting the unseen to the scene. One more uh, visual technology or, uh, that, that deserves mention here is, of course, film. Um, and one of our partners, the Harry Price Library, um, has a really excellent um, collection of um, film footage taken by Harry Price, who's probably the most famous or well-known um, early 20th century psychical investigator, where he records particular paranormal events. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the Brocken experiment where he, um, in, in, I think it's in 1936, um, goes to the Hearts Mounds and tries to recreate this, uh, this ritual whereby a virgin turns a goat into a young man. <laughs> and of course, this doesn't actually um, work. But I mean, I think what's interesting about the way that Price is using film is he's not using it um, simply to sort of record an experiment whose um, results are already known, can already be taken um, for granted. It's not just documentation, but it's part of the investigation, right? So what can the camera see that maybe a naked eye wouldn't see? And he does that, you know, also when he's filming people like the, the famous Indian mystic Kuda books and, and his fireworks. So yeah, the archives you're working with have um, all kinds of, of media that have been implicated in the history of occultism, spiritualism, and psychical research. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's fascinating. And, and as you say there, the, the, the point where these technologies, as well as the science, is kind of up for grabs. Like, what can these things do yeah. in the same way as what, you know, what, what do we believe, what is true, what isn't, are all kind of being established in, you know, as they're working together. It's really fascinating. Um, so on that, I mean, we've kind of talked about some of the objects that are... Um, that are kind of uh, under consideration, I suppose, in the project. And as has been mentioned, the project um, is a collaboration with the Science Museum Group and Senate House Library. Um, and all of the kind of objects that have been mentioned are, are kind of in the collection. Um, so could you tell us then, each of you, um, do you have a favorite object? Uh, what, what is that object in the collection? Uh, what's its story? Um, and what does it kind of tell us about science, technology and the occult? I like to, to, to use objects that don't necessarily stand out immediately as being associated to an occultic past. And I want to use those types of objects to show how there's these unorthodox histories associated to them. So one good example is the Brownie Crystal Receiver, which was manufactured in London by JWB Wireless Company and it's a crystal radio, and it, it's the type of radio that was often used by spiritualists and occultists in the 1920s to try and communicate with entities beyond the veil. These devices, which became these important tools for those modern, technologically savvy spiritualists, had something in common with aspects of spiritualist theories regarding communications with the dead, in that much like mediums under trance, these radios seemingly function via some unseen energy. So the sounds they picked up could be reinterpreted as supernatural in origin, even though in reality, these crystal radios didn't require energy sources such as electrical outlets to function because they were powered by radio waves. And so it was, it was possible for these occultists and spiritualists to rationalize these new kinds of technologies as embodying the types of unseen energies that functioned in you know, the way in which they believed spiritualist and psychic forces functioned as being occultic or supernatural. And again, they're low frequency radios, they don't plug in, and it creates a very personalized experience as well. Again, and it's internalized because they don't have speakers, they only have headphones. And so it also has much in common with the way in which a medium can speak internally with spirits as well, just like this is an internalized experience. And of course, you add to that, that some of the early developers of radio technology are massive spiritualists, including people like Oliver Lodge. So Oliver Lodge is you know, one of the people who is really significant in the history of radio. 
And he's also his best-selling book in his career. And he's, you know, one of the most famous physicists of the late 19th century was actually his book, Raymond, which is about his attempts to speak to his dead son's spirit, Raymond, with the help of, I believe it's, uh, is it Osborne that's the medium in that book, Christine? And so that's his best-selling book, which again is quite telling in terms of how broader audiences related and got familiar with Lodge wasn't through his hard science, but through his spiritualist work. So you can see how all these things connect together. And it's from this, you know, very sort of everyday 1920s type radio that you can begin to see these unorthodox stories. That's great. Thanks, Ephraim. I'm sorry, Christine. You were nodding there when Ephraim asked about the um, about Raymond as well. So yes, that was... <laughs> A classic work of, uh, of, of early 20th century spirit soldier memoir. Um, Raymond is great. Um, yeah, in terms of objects, I'll maybe talk a little bit about the Cottingley fairy cameras, which you can see on display at the National Science and Media Museum um, in Bradford. And they're fascinating. They would, they would be fascinating without um, the story around them. There are, I believe, four cameras, um, uh, uh, or is it three, maybe? Sorry, there's a Midge camera with which um, Frances Griffith and Elsie Wright's um, young girls in 1917 uh, allegedly took photos of fairies at the bottom of their garden. Uh, these photos become public. They become subject to intense press scrutiny. And then um, Arthur Conan Doyle, the period's most famous spiritualist, um, gifts them with um, more expensive cameo box cameras with which to take further photographs. Um, I think these objects are fascinating um, in terms of their status uh, and their role in the democratization of photography in this period. Photographic technology is newly affordable. Um, the midge camera certainly is, is, is relatively cheap in this period. Um, it's an automatic process. It's something that can be done at home. And also it's something that can be manipulated for fun and entertainment. So it's really well known in this period that you can take a, a fake photo, a double exposure if you want. And that actually in some cases, this becomes part of the advertising for these projects. Um, but in terms of their role in the, in the case of uh, the Cottingley fairies, I find these objects fascinating um, in the way that they are held. Their use is supposed to be beyond the expertise of young girls, of young women, right? I mean, part of the, the way in which um, believers of Cottingley and Cottingley fairies credential their, their belief, as they say, there's no way there's no way young girls could have taken these photos, they couldn't have done the cutouts, they couldn't have focused it, and so forth. So really, that response, um, and the, the way that the, the pictures receive, have a lot to tell us about perceptions of women and science and technology in this time. And then that, that obviously comes into and plays with um, the history of the paranormal. So, um, yeah, they're they're beautiful. And I, I always check them out when I come to Bradford. I think um, some of the ideas that Christine sort of gestured towards there, but also um, has brought up before in a talk that she gave for the uh, Bradford, the Science Museum at Bradford, um, related to class is really interesting and sort of gets me a little bit into my favorite object. You know, there's a lot, one of the things our project is always dealing with is the ways in which the credentials, the social standing, the age and gender, the class of the individuals involved uh, really is wrapped up in these questions of, um, of trust and proof and reliability. And my favorite set of objects sort of hands down are the um, photographs at the, at Senate House Library in the Harry Price archives of the Boston-based medium, uh, Marjorie Crandon, who was married to a physician. And in the 1920s and 30s, she became this really notorious so-called physical medium, meaning she produced a physical substance, ecto or teleplasm from her body um, during, apparently during a trance state. And the objects that I'm interested in are the photographs that, that document this process. Uh, they're technical photographs, and there's a really interesting relationship between, you know, that entangled history of uh, documentary photography and science there, 
but also the gender of Marjorie and the, so the sort of social and professional standing of her physician husband is one reason that this case becomes really famous and is um, a main reason, I think, that the range of psychical researchers who studied her, which included not only sort of uh, physicians and uh, psychical researchers of the Harry Price ilk, but also magicians like Harry Houdini, um, you know, and, and the, the photographs really, you know, often on the back of the photos, it'll be written uh, good control, meaning sort of the scientific testing conditions under which the photo were taken uh, were meant to be perfect. But often there's other sorts of control that are evidently going on in the photographs. She's tied up to make sure that her hands can't move and sort of, um, you know, conjure some of the, the, the ectoplasm that she's producing. But they make for these sorts of haunting and quite harrowing images. And I'm, I've been really interested in sort of those interlinked questions of um, agency and control and verifiability and proof that are sort of circulating around these objects. In addition to the fact that they're just really weird. I mean, you know, it's like a, an ectoplasmic hand emerging from her navel and being fingerprinted in wax so that they can test whether it's actually a spirit or not. They're, they're incredible. And doesn't Emma, correct me if I'm, I'm right, uh, Senate House does have some actual ectoplasm, don't they? Um, not Senate House, but I think, um, is it Oxford or Cambridge? It's, they, I asked them and they said no, but um, okay. yeah. But, but there is ectoplasm held in-, in There the is, God, what's her name? If you give me a second, I can look up whose it is. Sure, but it's, I it's a different- it yeah. held? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I mean, you can go there and, oh, I mean, I, I, I never would request to see it. You can imagine the smell, too, of 100-year-old ectoplasm and where it might have been, you know? So, um, yeah, we're not, we're not actually <laughs> looking at ectoplasm in our project. Uh, okay. We are in the sense that uh, Shannon Taggart, who, who is a... a, a an art photographer who did a wonderful talk as part of our project earlier and has been for the past 20 years photographing seances in Lilydale, which is sort of the spiritual home of the spiritualist movement in the United States. It's just outside of Buffalo, uh, which is also where um, a lot of the most famous early mediums came from. So it's a really significant area. And um, actually she talks quite a lot about ectoplasm because of course, Ectoplasm is also seen as being part of an extension of the medium's body, their person. And so one isn't really allowed to touch it because it would it's it's like touching someone, someone's most intimate place because of the way in which it's conceived. And so getting a, a sample of ectoplasm even back in the 19th, early 20th century was extremely risky to do because of the way in which um, it broke so many spiritualist protocols to even think of taking a sample of it. Uh, but of course, there are many instances where people broke those protocols and it leads to all sorts of controversies. It's, it's Helen Duncan's ectoplasm. It's imitation silk and it's held at Cambridge. And Helen Duncan, for those who don't know, was a medium who was the last woman to be convicted under the Witchcraft Act of um, 1730 something. It's just so fascinating. It's such an interesting area of study. And one thing you said there, Emma, just struck me that they wanted to fingerprint the ectoplasmic hand. I just wonder what were going to be their controls on that. How did they prove that therefore is a spirit or is not? Like they don't have a database of spirit fingerprints to compare to, do they? Just such an interesting concept that that would be like the bar of, of truth um, to verify that this thing is real. Yeah, especially since it was a sp the spirit belonged to her brother Walter, so a specific uh, individual, okay. but they didn't have any fingerprints yeah. from Walter. So it becomes absolutely there's the sort of um, yeah the sort of infinite loop of sort of what is needed for proof and what is used for proof that sort of goes back and forth between the mediums and the researchers. It's really interesting. I think it highlights one of those key problems as well with spiritualism, at least which is that fundamentally the crux of most cases is based on testimony. And just like with court cases, testimony is a very unstable source of evidence to win a case with. And so any opportunity to try and capture physical evidence 
is seen as an opportunity to really strengthen the rigor of what you're trying to prove, which is why they're doing these things. So I, I would interpret it, having worked with spiritualists for almost 40 years now, <laughs> I would interpret it as not so much we want to get the fingerprints themselves to say, is this person? That's certainly part of it. But just being able to fingerprint it means that something real was there, that you were able to capture for a moment something that existed within that space. And that in itself is much more concrete, direct evidence than what is often sort of very much circumstantial evidence, which you wouldn't be able to convince most skeptics with. Yeah, no, yeah. And, and as you say, that kind of that breaking of the loop, I mean, this is this is a kind of in terms of STS or science technology studies, there's a kind of classic concept, the experiment has regressed or, and, you know, how do you how, how do you know what your technology is meant to do or what, what your theory is? And, and you, without, you know, they're both both things are up for grabs. It's that same kind of problem all over again. It just it just strikes me as, as, as fascinating. And also something um, you mentioned, Christine, as well, about about how and, and, and yourself, Emma, actually, about how kind of class and gender uh, are kind of implicated in these objects. I think it's fascinating. I mean, and how how they kind of played out in terms of trust and uh, and things like that. I mean, uh, I, it's fascinating. I, I definitely want to come to the collection and have a look at these things now. <laughs> I don't have anything else. So yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And I, I have looked at some of those um, ectoplasm pictures and they are eerie and absurdly, there's like an absurd beauty to them as well. It's very strange. There's something totally, I don't know, it's engrossing with it it's um they're, they're amazing and maybe we'll put or try and link some on the website when when this goes out um but i was just thinking so both uh, spiritual believers um and and also skeptics were kind of it seems that they were both using technologies at this time but i was just wondering did they use the same objects um and if so did they use the objects in different ways yeah, that's that's a, a great question. Um, there are um, some, uh, of course, there are uh, bespoke technologies that, that only um, either side would use. I mean, I'm thinking about um, specific spiritualist technologies like the spirit planchette used in seances to capture messages and so forth. That that never really <laughs> becomes used or or, or, or tested in um, scientific experiments, but. Um, spiritualists are just very eager to um, to credential themselves and align themselves with science. So that means that um, uh, all kinds of scientific or I'm going to use the word scientistic. All of ha Hammer uses this word to refer to concepts or instruments that seem close to science or they have the appearance of being scientific without necessarily being so. Um, uh, are used by spiritualists um, to, um, uh, to to try and measure, um, you know, things like auras and rays and so forth. Um, certainly, in terms of a technology, they both share. We I feel like we keep talking about photography, but it is it's such an important one. Um, uh, time and time again, we see that feedback loop that well, you were talking about where spiritualists uh, will use the camera to document um, spirit extra, extras, manifestations, faces, right, um, as proof that there really was a presence in that room and to get everyone who could then look at these photos to witness alongside them. So these, these images are then published in other forms of mass media. The most important one here, of course, is the popular press um, as a way of trying to win converts. Um, but of course, photography can then be used um, to um, produce close-ups to show the origins of spirit faces that seem to have appeared for the first time um, in a seance room, but maybe actually are taken from <laughs> a journal article, an illustration published a, a year earlier. Um, uh, or um, I'm thinking particularly with the Cottingley Fairy case, it's, uh, I think it's in the 1980s, that um, the uh, stage magician, the amazing Randy, right, is able to use super high powered photographic technology used by NASA actually, which is a really interesting <laughs> intervention in this case to show for the first time um, the, the mechanism by which the pin up pictures of the, of, of the little fairies are actually suspended, right? So you can use that to either claim that this is true or to show that it's bogus. Or of course you could use a sheer technology just to um, to duplicate an effect, right? If someone says, you know, my instrument has captured this, there's there's no other way that I could have got this effect unless um, something supernatural was happening or 
in, in, in real life. Um, someone else, a professional photographer or stage magician might say, actually, I'm going to use um, uh, I'm going to use my radio. I'm going to use my tape recorder and show you, in fact, that this can be done. This can be duplicated from entirely uh, material means. So there, there absolutely is a crossover in the kind of um, technologies that are being used, and and really it just shows you, yeah, the the, the, the flexibility of these media, right, um, and the way that they can they can accommodate all kinds of different and often competing truth claims. You mentioned believers who are scientists, and I think uh, one of these is William Crookes, who's a really important part of our project. He was a chemist, physicist, uh, 19th century, and also a spiritualist. And um, he was working with the Crookes tube, sort of named for him, a, a glass tube used in the 19, late 19th century for studying cathode rays, you know, these sorts of uh, invisible or rather semi-visible electrically charged rays emitted from an, an aluminum disc in the tube. Um, and Crookes was sort of using this object in ways directly related to his spiritualist beliefs in as much as he was investigating what he theorized to be radiant matter uh, which he thought was the sort of new kind of matter that that behaved, that was material, but behaved more like an imponderable, immaterial entity. Um, and he sort of drew explicit attention in some of his uh, talks on the subject to how this new spectacular discovery brought us to the borderlands of the known and the unknown, to sort of the boundaries of science, and um, sort of suggested that the 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 visible or ponderable matter of our experience might not be all there is to the world, all there is to the universe, which is a very spiritualist belief. And then sort of in a, a nice twist, the, the Crookes ray ends up being what is used by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen to discover X-rays in 1895 or six. Um, and that in, in turn sort of sets off this, this set of spiritualist and occult um, it set off a media storm really and um, there were a bunch of things published on this sort of new photography of the invisible and intimations made that Röntgen who wasn't using you know the object that the spiritualist physicist Crookes developed to uncover radiant matter um, but was using it as a quote-unquote sort of purely scientific object ends up discovering something that uh, becomes used by spiritualists to argue that there is indeed an invisible world and we can penetrate it. So I think that that's quite a good example of one of these cases where believer, scientist, you know, they sort of really get tangled up and it sort of shows the, yeah, the complexity of that relationship. Yeah, that's, that's so fascinating and it, and it, it perfectly anticipates kind of the, the sort of what I wanted to kind of just move on to, but that exact relationship as we've been kind of talking uh, uh, as we've been having this conversation about this sort of, intermingling or the, or, or the kind of crossover or, or the non-neat boundaries between the sort of scientific community as it were and the spiritless, spiritualist community which from the discussion it sounds like at least early in this period are you know a lot of the people a lot of people are in both if you like but I suppose if you think about now that is you know that the, where we've got to in, in terms of there's some fairly clear boundaries you, you, we, we, we imagine now between sort of science and, and this kind of practice so I'm just I'm, I'm wondering how is there a sense in which the period you're looking at that these boundaries start to emerge? Do these boundaries kind of start to harden? Is there a separation between the sort of spiritualist, occultist and, and scientific communities? And sort of are, are those boundaries, you know, do that, are those kind of boundaries reflected in or evident in the objects that you're kind of looking at? You know, do people, you know, we've talked about people using objects in a similar way. Do they start to, you know, differentiate? Do these boundaries start to harden? Um, I'll I'll maybe start there. Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think um, the the rapprochement between spiritualism and science, such as there was one, and I think it's important not to overstate that there was still a lot of scientific contempt for spiritualism in the nineteenth century. But if anything, um, I think that um, that has has only heightened, intensified, hardened in our current moment. Um, for a number of reasons, right? Um, uh, some of them are scientific. Um, uh, psychology, the discovery of the unconscious finds an alternate way to account for things that seem to be like trance or possession or mediumship. Um, changes in, in physics, for example, we move to a, a quantum understanding of the universe, we get rid of ether theory and so forth. 
Um, in terms of larger reasons, I think, you know, the objections that, that, that scientists um, have to um, spiritualist interpret or occult interpretations of the world now are in, in many ways broadly similar to what they were in the 19th century, you know, that they're there's there's not a lot of convincing proof or any convincing proof that um, test results seeming um, uh, phenomena are very difficult to replicate or or falsify um, and of course there's there's an association of of, of some of these phenomena with with charlatanism and so forth um, so that's still there but I think one of the reasons why um, that you know that relationship is is um, certain from the scientific standpoint, more contentious now than ever, is because there, I, I believe that there's a greater perception of harm from potential mingling of these two realms, right? And I think that has a lot to do with another medium, which we're not actually examining in this, in this project, but it's obviously relevant to it, which is just the growth of social media um, and, and the kind of democratization knowledge that represents. Um, I don't think there would have been as, as much fear in the 1880s, for example, about a public having a faulty understanding of physics that included the potential for ether um, as there is now about, um, you know, a, a potential misunderstanding or an occult understanding of, of, of the body or of medicine that wouldn't, would, you know, maybe maybe be anti-vaccinationist for example and that that was very much um, an occultist cause in the 19th century not exclusively an occultic cause but it was one of the occultist causes in the 19th century so um so yes i think the relationship and the distinction um is uh well yeah the the, the relationship of scientists the willingness of, of the scientific community to even investigate these fields um is, is far lower now than it was and i think that has much to do with perceived harm um, but at the same time it's always worth saying when we talk about these topics it is it is a misperception to assume that people who identify with or engage or believe in um, spiritualist um, ways of seeing the world are anti-scientific right that that you know it, that if they are taking up these beliefs they themselves must be um, rejecting science simply the evidence does not support that um, so yeah, I think we again that's another area where we we just need to be careful when we're thinking about the relationship between these two. The the rise of scientific naturalism uh, is significant to the story of spiritualism, in that the stronger its position becomes by the end of the nineteenth century, early twentieth century, um, the more uh, well rather the less there is opportunities for spiritualism to sort of find a, a, a place within that new paradigm of the natural world. Even though there are still into the early 20th century some key figures who are trying to again solidify the position of spiritualism within scientific naturalism, Alfred Russell Wallace being a key person there, um, it's ultimately unsuccessful. But where I would say in the contemporary, you still see a lot of work in, in, the, in the sciences broadly conceived. Um, well, it would be in, in medicine and in psychology where you still have a lot of work primarily to debunk, of course, and to rationalize extraordinary belief. But there's still quite a lot of research that's done in psychology to understand extraordinary belief. And in medicine, there's, there's still pockets of research done into things like miracles. And miracles have traditionally been seen as a, a key part of occultic and spiritualist belief as well. And so it still has its places within science, but uh, those places are just not necessarily where you'd expect to find them. You have to dig, but they're there and they are well-funded in some cases. In terms of the objects, I think it, it would follow what I've just said in that as you advance into the 20th century, a lot of the sorts of things that continue to be associated with those kinds of beliefs are the things within the human sciences and medicine. Whereas the stuff in the physical sciences, which is so dominant in the 19th century, 
really starts to, to move away, even though obviously photography is still used and you can still buy state-of-the-art aura cams right now to take pictures and capture people's auras with it. Um, you don't have the same level of attention to it, for instance, in photographic journals as you would in the 19th century. So that technology is still there. There's still a huge appetite and interest in it. Um, so it hasn't disappeared, but I do think where it is now has changed significantly. Seems to me actually, Ephraim, when you're talking there, the, the real legacy of that um, material culture of 19th century spiritualism, where we can see it is actually in popular culture today in contemporary horror film, I think, which is obsessed with technological artifacts and often with obsolete technological artifacts, the way that the old technologies might offer a portal into another world or another dimension um, in the way that new ones maybe don't, although sometimes new ones, ones do, um, whereby the watching um, of particular videos, I'm thinking of the Ring movies uh, here, um, or um, uh, even, you know, even use of Zoom calls during the pandemic might provide a kind of otherworldly portal. So even if we don't see, um, as Ephraim was saying, um, you know, a, a significant mainstream use of, um, of technological devices uh, for religious purposes, um, there's obviously a lingering allure of that for artists um, um, uh, and writers, creative practitioners. And, and we have some, some, um, uh, uh, some people like that involved in our project as well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just fascinating. And, and just to kind of build on, on or just thinking about it aloud on that point that it's actually quite interesting that it seems from your point you're saying there from that you know some of the this this there is a longer tail than maybe we imagine there to be within the science you know people are doing this research on uh, in medicine and things i know there are people who do research on parapsychology or at least there was well into the sort of 70s and 80s the extent to which it's mainstream science i think is up for debate but it's still kind of going on in places but what's interesting is that perhaps if this long tail exists in science it doesn't so much exist in the popular imagination of what science is now whereas now you know there is this kind of more popular perception of science being more rational than it is now and maybe 150 years ago the, the people could potentially entertain occultism in, in science in the same breath but now scientists wouldn't do that you know so maybe there's something to be said for the popular kind of that this boundary work is happening in public as much as it's happening in science you know this is this is people drawing a public for you know and that's kind of what you know we talk about boundary work, that's kind of what it is as well as internal it's also external kind of you know face to it you know this is people saying that what science is isn't like that even if maybe we do a little bit of on the side so yeah i mean it's it's, it's, a, it's just such a fascinating fascinating project project you've got going on. and that is something in itself that's quite interesting because of course there's a distinction between the popular narratives of spiritualism and science in the 19th century and the elite discussions and where the biggest debates usually happen is when elite scientists are trying to engage those broader audiences. But if you look at, for instance, the general periodical press and the spiritualist press, it's a very different discussion. And what I always like to tell people is that you'd be hard pressed, especially in the 19th century, to find anyone who hadn't at some point sat in a seance, because it's one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the period. And so everyone had some connection to it and participated in some capacity. And to a certain degree, you can, you can when you think about the broad sort of relationship to um, the supernatural, that's never disappeared. It's always been part of you know, popular culture. How many psychic research shows are there on TV? People love that stuff. It's a huge industry. And a lot of people, you know, recognize psychical researchers as being important scientific researchers. Whether they're accepted by elite science, well, that's another debate altogether. But again, they're still seen as important established experts in a, in a field where, you know, spiritualists is one of the biggest sort of growing religions in the United States. There's a lot of belief. There's a lot of people who believe in mediumship. There's a lot of people who believe in ghosts. And so I think we underestimate it because we're always thinking about that false elite narrative. But actually, if you get away from academics and just talk to people who aren't in academia, it's a very different picture. To which I just wanted to add also, I've been thinking about, um, you know, if you think of one of the, the central tenets of spiritualism, at least 19th century spiritualism, 
um, as relating to sort of this idea of uh, disembodied consciousness or not disembodied, but um, non-visible consciousness. I think there's a lot of that still going on in different ways. I immediately thought of Google's deep dream project or even a lot of the debates going around, you know, surrounding AI and artificial intelligence. You know, I, I don't think we've lost any of our fascination with sort of those connections between technology, consciousness, and sort of the disembodied and the extent to which things are disembodied. Because of course, the main argument of spiritualism is that they're not and that they're somewhere between the material and immaterial, like a lot of the technologies we continue to consume, which, you know, may be wireless and invisible, but have a real energy cost or are stored on servers. Yeah. Thanks for that, Emma. And I think that is a perfect thought to uh, bring our discussion to a close. I just want to thank you, Christine, Ephraim and Emma, uh, for allowing us to telepathically extract your consciousness and record it. And uh, it'll be uh, going straight to the ears of our listeners. I'm sure we'll enjoy this conversation as much as we have. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. And that's it from us. If you'd like to find out more about the Media of Mediumship project, head over to the website mediaofmediumship.stir.ac.uk. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever other podcast platform you use. And if you've got any questions, you can get in contact with us on Twitter at science underscore belief. Thanks again to our guests, Christine Ferguson, Ephraim Sierra Schreier and Emma Merkling, and to my co-host, Will Mason Wilkes. I'm James Riley, and this is the Science and Belief in Society podcast. Mm-hmm.